Hello, Californians and fellow travelers, and welcome to the 2020 California National Party Virtual Convention. Yep, here it is. We're going to try it out. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, uh, we normally gather together in person, and this is uh, one of the most uh, important and exciting times in the party every year. We're able to get together, exchange ideas, engage in group discussion, and just have those basic forms of human socializing that I think everybody uh, is, is consciously aware of lacking right now, but obviously this year that is not possible. That said, events in California have made it more important than ever that the California National Party get together to remind us all that there is real human suffering taking place in California right now and that there is real potential happening in California right now. That at this moment in history, here we are, burdened with an incompetent, uncaring federal government that would rather increase shower head flow than save human lives. And at the same time, we have a state Democratic Party whose best known figures apparently seem far more interested in increasing their federal prestige and advancing their careers than doing right by everyday Californians. So faced with all this, we felt that it was important uh, those of us in the CMP, that we should come together as Californians, even in this less than ideal medium. Because unless we do this, unless we get together, unless we remember that it is up to us, not the one-party state government, certainly not the distant and effective federal government, but it's up to us, the people of California, to fight for ourselves and to fight for our interests. No one else will ever do that for us. And especially as this convention is going out in the midst of a massive, often triple digit heat wave across California, stoking wildfires, showing us yet another consequence of the long term environmental irresponsibility that we've lived with under the federal government. As we look at our economy, which is in danger while our tax dollars still get used to pay for the United States. As we sit here watching this convention on a video screen because Trump flu is spreading largely unchecked across an entire continent. As we sit here and face these issues, can any listener honestly believe that the United States will solve these problems for California? For too long, California has failed to recognize the need to take responsibility for our own solutions to our problems. It's becoming increasingly clear that we cannot afford to ignore our responsibilities for much longer. And so it's with that in mind that we have felt it important to put together this 2020 convention, especially considering that November elections are coming up. And even though there is this large federal presidential election, which is sucking up all of the media airtime, and, you know, internet time and all other modern forms of media, we have issues that are taking place here in California. We have many important propositions that are going to go before California voters in November that we'll talk about in a bit. And so we're going to open this convention with our CMP endorsed candidate for the trustee of the Los Rios Community College District, Scott Schmidt, who's going to open this discussion. This will be followed uh, by a roundtable a conversation between myself, Bill Skog, and Theo Slater regarding universal basic income and negative income tax, which are two important aspects of our new economy plan that I think are worth exploring. And finally, we'll be hearing from Yvonne Hargrove, our party secretary, who will be discussing our Medi-Cal for All proposal uh, in our new health care plank, and especially given present conditions, all of these different things, you know, universal basic income, Medi-Cal for all, these are becoming increasingly important uh, to Californians given the issues that we are facing at the present moment. Uh, so that being said, uh, we'll, we'll hear the, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, listen to the, uh, these speeches uh, and then take uh, a brief break. Uh, we'll follow that up with speeches from our uh, candidates for the leadership committee uh, followed by another break, uh, and then we'll have a third section on party building. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. 
Hello everyone, my name is Scott Schmidt, and I really want to say thank you for the endorsement from the California National Party in terms of my race. Uh, for those who don't know, my race is Los Rios Trustee District 7. Um, the reason I'm running is because right now a lot of students, uh, for the most part, are suffering in terms of uh, having food insecurity, uh, lack of housing. Uh, approximately 19% of all students are currently homeless according to uh, several statistics uh, throughout the state. And additionally, a lot of them do go to the bed hungry and we don't really do enough to make sure that they're safe and also taken care of because our institution should be the ones who do take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. We can depend on community all we want, but in the long run, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be left out of the whole uh, ability to get help, so we really need to help them. Um, as Los Rios trustee, um, I would like to help students gain real employment, not just work underpaid jobs or jobs in which are uh, minimum wage after they get degrees. I know plenty after I graduated from uh, Chico State as a uh, BA in public administration that had no job opportunities and for those who did it was a very selective and hard process to really get through due to, to it being public administration uh, additionally i think teachers and staff should get paid very fair wages while we trim more of the the higher administrative and executive salaries at the university level that, that includes the chancellors the presidents anyone who makes Triple digits, well, all teachers very barely get by is wrong inherently, and I would trim it and make sure it was more equitable as a whole. Also, students need somewhere to stay. At minimum, we should be able to provide some type of uh, parking lot for them to stay. I, I, as sad as it sounds, uh, we, although Los Rios can't provide actual housing right now, at minimum, they can provide a safe parking lot for students to, to, to stay in in their cars at minimum so they can feel safe and oh, by the way the sound you're hearing is my parrot chirping he's right here okay thank you greg and to make sure that they're safe it, it, it it's unconscionable unconsciousable that we don't try to take care of our students who really need our help right now and also they have no emphasis on increasing apprenticeship, uh, working with unions, finding a way to have a pipeline towards actual job uh, acquirement. Uh, because right now, a lot of counseling that goes on in, in universities, they usually say, you could take XYZ classes, but in the long run, I'm not going to tell you what to do uh, when it comes to getting a job. And a lot of people think, well, I'll get all this debt up to my eyeballs and it'll all pay off in the long run. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people get screwed in the process and it just doesn't work out. And uh, I want to be able to ha make that school the job pipeline within the Los Rios trustee district to be able to do that. Um, additionally, I want to mention I am not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, um, I'm actually a, a uh, registered libertarian. Um, but at the same time, I'm totally independent from even the typical mindset of, of any political party. I, I, I think this race and most of government as a whole, public administration as a whole, shouldn't have a partisan leaning. It should be based on what the people need and how we can get it to them. So that's how I feel. Thank you, Greg. I'm glad you agree with me. Um, also, um... I want to mention my website's name is fixlosrios.com because I believe it is broken. The system as a whole is broken. We have students who have nowhere to go. Uh, they're homeless. They can't. They have no nothing to eat. And trustees and administrators seem to be more interested in uh, raising taxes on uh, on people through sales taxes, which primarily hurt the the working class. Uh, I'm totally against all sales taxes. I think we should be raising more taxes on those who are more wealthy and more progressive taxation to make it more equitable because a lot of people who barely get by can barely afford an increase in their day-to-day -day gasoline or their uh, 
even their houses. Some homeowners simply have houses because they purchased it 10 or 20 years in the past, and now um, that's all they have. I mean, understandably, it's a nest egg, but it's, it's something that they have now, but they, they can't even afford their taxes sometimes due to uh, job issues or economic issues as a whole. So again, I want to thank you uh, for endorsing me uh, for my race. And if you can help me or support me, my website is fixlosrios.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook uh, under Fix Los Rios also. And I really want to say that I appreciate everything uh, the California National Party has done. And I also uh, want to mention that uh, I have been creating an organization called California's Democratic Reforms. And it's a uh, multi-partisan third-party movement to encompass a, a un unified plan of all the smaller parties so we can find a way to get rid of the duopoly or at least break it down because th this we, we are stronger together than we are independently. And I think with, m with my organization and others, we can find some way to change electoral forms and create ranked choice voting throughout the state, undo top two, and really get things done. So again, thank you for for uh, listening to what I have to say. I'm sorry if I mumbled a little bit, and, and uh, Greg also said, said a few things throughout the whole time. But thanks again, and uh, I really appreciate it. Hope you guys have a, a good convention. Have a good day. I'm Bill Skog. I'm with Michael Lobes and Theo Slater. We're part of the California National Party, and today we're going to discuss welfare reform in the in our policy with universal basic income included with a negative income tax. So I guess I'll, I'll go with Theo first because he's in my, my top right corner there. What is the nuts and bolts of our UBI negative income tax policy? Well, I'll talk about UBI and I'll let uh, Michael talk about the negative income tax. Essentially what we're looking at is a policy where we would send out a certain amount of money to um, every single Californian on a monthly basis. And this would have a few advantages. It would allow us to get rid of other social welfare programs that provide money to people based on need because essentially what the UBI would create is a floor on poverty. So no matter who you are, as long as you live in California, you'd get this monthly uh, amount of money and that way we don't have to means test people. We don't have to keep track of how much everyone's earning. We don't have to have like an array of different poverty elimination, uh, a whole bunch of different policies and uh, procedures and options could all be swept aside because it would all be covered under everyone getting a check every single month. And so that would save a huge amount of money in terms of the overhead of administering all these um, poverty programs. And it would also provide people with a source of income from the government that was not stigmatized because currently all of the social welfare, welfare programs are plagued with this stigma that only poor people get them. And, and in America and in California, a lot of people tend to look down on poor people, unfortunately, so that, you know, we would, re we would remove the stigma from the program because everyone would be getting the check. So there'd be nothing wrong with getting the check. And also people wouldn't complain that, you know, they deserve it, but someone else doesn't because everyone would be getting it. So it just kind of sweeps aside a whole bunch of problems with the current system and it saves a whole bunch of money in terms of overhead. I'll just say there's two things that you brought up right away that I think are very important. Efficiency in government is not a bad thing. Reducing cost, unnecessary waste is good. Um, the fact that, you know, we're not going to have administrators looking to see if people qualify. And the other point you brought up was the dehumanizing part. Um, people don't want to be poor. And there's a lot of, you know, shame, depression. They say your functional IQ drops when you have financial stress. So I think both what you said is really hits home. And it's, it's, it's very true. Um, what else is I going to ask you on that along those lines? When it comes to UBI, we're talking, I saw on our platform, $500 a month. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's the. I think that's the updated platform, the two, the 2020 platform that our party members will soon vote to uh, approve. And the other thing I think with UBI that we we hit on our platform is automation, and the fact that um, I know people use Moore's law to. It's originally about microchips, but it can be used with technology and job displacement. Retail work is being displaced as we speak. Once self-driving trucks come along, these are massive job losses. And to have a UBI in place um, to assure that everyone has the means to survive is, is vital. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, UBI is really the solution to the approaching um, automation takeover of large components of the society. Once cars and trucks are automated, transportation right now is the largest job sector. So you're talking about eliminating a huge number of jobs in a very short period of time. And I mean, a lot of other things will get automated too. I mean, if any, recently computers have beat human beings at Go and at chess, and if you can do that kind of abstract thinking as a computer, then you know that you can probably get a computer that can give you better legal answers than a lot of lawyers, uh, can give you better diagnostics than a lot of doctors. So there's really people who think that they're safe from automation um, are not paying attention because automation is advancing at levels, historic levels that we've never seen before. And universal basic income is the answer. And is $500 a month enough to live on? No, but it's the beginning of something. It's to prove the concept and then that number can be adjusted to whatever is humane for our society. Because obviously California is a very expensive place, but I can't think of anyone who couldn't benefit from $500 a month. One thing I love about the California National Party's platform on this is that it's a hybrid of UBI and a negative income tax. Um, I learned about the negative income tax from Milton Friedman before I really knew what universal basic income was. Um, and I think what's interesting about both of these policies is they are, they're nonpartisan. You get support from the right, you get support from the left, you get support from people who are looking at the issue on unbiased and are just looking at helping people. So Michael, you are the, um, I would say the architect in the platform of the negative income tax. Would you like to explain that and how it, it will help people in California? Sure. Yeah. I mean, cause I think, uh, you know, I think this is. I, I think as you as you mentioned, it's it's the the combination of these two that that I think is is important for this first step that Theo is talking about. Because you know, as he says, UBI of, of five hundred dollars a month, um, you know, is is life changing to to some people. And but I mean, the thing about UBI, which again removes the stigma Theo is talking about, is like you know, Mark Zuckerberg with $100 billion as a California resident gets the same $500 a month check that everybody does, which uh, is fine. And again, probably in terms of practical matters, he's paying more in taxes than he's getting back in his monthly UBI. And so it does correct this issue of the stigma of taking money from the government, but there's also the issue of getting money specifically to the people who are actually in need. Uh, of that money. And so the thing about negative income tax, so as you mentioned, negative income tax is an interesting thing. It's it's first popularized in Milton Friedman's Freedom and Capitalism. It was also embraced by the Green Party uh, not too long ago as a means of reducing the wasteful sort of, you know, social welfare network. Uh, so the idea of negative income tax is that up to a certain point, you don't pay any income at all on your wages. So the, the, the number that we have in the current platform is $40,000. So everybody is untaxed in their wages up to $40,000 per year. And if you make less than $40,000 a year, then you get half the difference between your income and $40,000. So for example, if you make $30,000 in one year, you get a $5,000 guaranteed income, half of the difference of $40,000 and $30,000. You make $20,000 a year, you get half of that difference, which is 10000 And so what it does is it gets money, it both gets money to the people who are most in need of that additional assistance. And especially if you, so if you have no income, half the difference between zero and 40 is 20000 So you just get a guaranteed $20,000 a year, you know, refund. 
And so what this does is this can be used along with UBI to replace this convoluted, complex web of the social welfare network at the California and federal level as it exists. It can, we can get rid of all these sort of different means tested things and simply give refunds guaranteed to people who will need them. And the thing about the negative income tax is because your refund is tied to the difference between your income and $40,000, if you have any income at all, you always wind up with more money at the end because all your income up to 40,000 is taxed. Because right now there's this very strange system and I know, um, you know, I know this is a, we're, uh, 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 you know, we're, we're gonna talk about this a bit in terms of, of healthcare. Uh, well, is this idea of right now with everybody losing their jobs, things like Medi-Cal are really difficult because there are people who are not tanking temporary work because they'll make too much money, they'll lose their Medi-Cal, they'll have to get through Covered California. Once the money comes out of Covered California, they're actually taking in less money than they were on unemployment. So why should I bother to get a temporary job? Whereas with something like negative income tax, you're always better off working somewhat. And I think the automation thing is, is big in this regard because yeah, like you say, UBI uh, can, can function as a remedy to that. We also talk about in the platform, uh, beginning to look at a seven day, uh, a seven hour work day, a 35 hour work week, because our now standard eight hour work day, 40 hour work week came from the Great Depression. It came from a share of the work philosophy that there was less employment, there were fewer jobs around. And so by instead of working 10 hours a day, working eight hours a day, more people could be employed for a shorter amount of time. And now, right now, the reason people don't want less than eight hours a day is you don't get health insurance. You know, you take, a, you take a pay cut and stuff like that. If everybody's getting UBI negative income tax, if we have a Medi-Cal for all system, those issues go away and you can work as much as you can work. And that will improve the quality of your life than if you just weren't working at all. But it doesn't necessitate this need to work yourself into the ground simply to stay alive. Um, and so I think this combination between UBI, which comes to everybody, which removes this stigma of, of government funding, combined with negative income tax that, that moves it to certain directions, I think is, is very beneficial. And just, just one last thing before, before I shut my face. I think it's also beneficial uh, in a lot of ways for rural California, because most of the economic benefit of the last few decades has been focused on urban coastal California. And many parts of, of rural California and inland California have been left behind. And so what UBI and negative income tax will do is move that in, that income, that, that California growth, that economic growth that isn't making its prosperity known in Lassen County, that isn't making its prosperity felt in India. And that can lead to sort of a greater cohesion of the wealth of California's economy benefiting all California. I think we all agree to one of the problems with our current welfare system is it doesn't encourage you to get a job because you're going to now work 40 hours at a job. Well, let's face it, a, 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 you know, a minimum wage job that's not going to be enjoyable. Um, it's going to be stress. You have daycare for most, a lot of the people who are on welfare. It ends up, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up to get off of welfare. This encourages people to work. And the other thing I wanted to talk about with this, both of this, UBI and the negative income tax, what do you guys think that will be? How will that help small businesses in California? Okay, I'll ask that to you. What, what do you think that does to help small businesses? In yes, well, I mean, I, I have a small business myself, um, and I think it would be helpful in a few ways. It will, um, it will, I think it would help me because, you know, getting $500 a month, I could put that into advertising. I could put that into various uh, possible uh, objectives. And, you know, obviously that's, that's gonna be beneficial to me. And I think it also helps in terms of people who I hire, they're less desperate. So I think that that helps me, you know, it helps them in negotiation with me uh, helping us work out um, what's fair compensation and things like that. Um, and if I want to take on somebody uh, for a temporary position, 
they, they have more flexibility because their income isn't completely dependent on me. And I think that also talking about Medi-Cal for all really helps small businesses because it lifts the burden of having to provide health care to their employees, which, people's employees, which is a huge expense. So I think it just gives a lot more flexibility to workers and to businesses to have workers be less desperate and less dependent on their employers. No, I was thinking about this policy the other day. <clears throat> and I was just in my mind thinking about a person who wants to be a baker, someone coming out of high school. They're going to get, with, with our policy, they're going to get free college, you know, trade school, whatever. Say they can stay home for two years, give some of that money to their parents. They could realistically get out of school being ready to be a baker and have $30,000 to start a small business. Things like that are great for our main streets. You were talking about rural areas in California, like thinking of a small town that doesn't have a lot of businesses, you get a great bakery that pops up. All of a sudden, business in that area starts to just increase and improve. So I look at this and I think a lot of just small business stimulus and it's going to encourage Californians, I think a lot to shop local, to go out and eat more. And um, yeah, it's going to keep money circulating through the economy, which is going to be very important when automation comes. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's important because I mean, definitely, uh, negative income tax and UBI are are part of a, a holistic program that exists in the in the CNP platform. You know, it's a combination of these things like and like Dio was alluding to, you know, Medi-Cal for all, which removes that burden of entry to so many small businesses. Um, you know, and of course, Medi-Cal for all doesn't prevent businesses of any size from offering some kind of supplemental insurance as an inducement to hiring, just like you would do, you know, with additional wages or additional time off. But it means every Californian has access to health care if they need it. And so having that off the plate makes, you know, as we look at the way the economy has been moving, the gig economy, the hustle economy, the biggest problems with these things are the fact that you're getting paid, you know, you're getting paid nothing while corporations benefit off you. You're not getting any health insurance. You know, but you can set your own hours if you have health issues, if you have a child care issue, if you have all these sorts of things, it looks real appealing. And once you can have things like negative income tax and UBI, once you can have things like Medi-Cal for all, once you can have another thing that, that, that you allude to that we have in the platform is this emphasis on supporting locally owned, community owned businesses so that it is the community locally who benefit from new businesses coming in. So when we talk about our, our California public bank, um, you know, we talk about the equity fund in there, which is to focus on helping communities and members of those communities form their own small businesses. And again, being able to remove things like dependency on a minimum wage or things like the need to offer health insurance, it makes it a lot easier to hire somebody who is willing to only come in and work eight to 12 hours a week because they can afford to have a job and a lifestyle where they work 10 or 12 hours at a couple different places because they don't need to get insurance from any of them. They don't need to accumulate, you know, certain types of benefits from any one and focus on working at that one job. And so as all of us, I think, are moving into uh, a type of employment, or at least many of us, at least, uh, in, in certain socioeconomic categories, are moving into a lifestyle that requires kind of this, you know, more divided employment, uh, I think things like UBI with negative income tax and things like Medi-Cal for all, things like focusing on smaller business models um, are going to are gonna be beneficial to this change that's happening in, in the California economy. And I think that's really the big thing. When we talk about things like negative income tax and UBI, talk about the possibility of 35-hour work week, is this is all just fundamentally part of the idea that California can't afford to imitate the way the United States does things. We can't just say, this is how the United States treats the work week. This is how the United States treats insurance. This is how the United States treats taxation. California, as part of the United States, simply has to uh, imitate that. I mean, I think even as, as we remain part of the United States, what's important is California, which has always been an innovator, needs to innovate in the way it's approaching this coming change to employment in the 21st century. There's been a few interesting studies that say people who have more money volunteer more. And I'm looking at this as my, I'm now um, a stay at home parent. I have two kids, one who has special needs. I am now going to get paid $26,000 to be a better parent. 
And I think you're going to see when this gets implemented, you're going to see way more parents volunteering at their schools to help the teachers. So you're going to see schools just become better just because you're having more volunteers. You're going to have more little league volunteers. You're going to have more Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, theater volunteers. It really enriches the community because a lot of these people for the longest time have associated their worth with their jobs. Uh, I think when you're giving, when the government, when California says we believe in you and we believe that you will find purpose, people are going to find purpose in volunteer work. And it's going to just help the community organically, as we've been talking about, just by having more volunteers. One of the other things I think that will help out too is with crime. I think a lot of crime is due to poverty. Um, you know, if you, do you want to be a criminal and lose out on these benefits? Or would you rather sit home and not commit crime and make money? I know that sounds very morbid, but um, I think it's true. I would rather, I'd rather pay people not to commit crime. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, many people have this visceral reaction. Uh, and, and obviously, like, we can have a lot of debate and discussion on sort of like uh, the efficacy of that. But like, I think it's pretty, pretty true that like, keeping prisoners alive and locked up and fed and, you know, with a modicum of healthcare costs a hell of a lot more uh, than just providing those things on the outside. What I always think of is uh, uh, the, the philosopher and political economist of the 19th century, John Stuart Mill, who, who was very much in favor of, of you know, a strong uh, social safety net. He says, if people who break the law get a roof over their head and two meals a day and basic health care, why do people who don't break the law? Like, why, why do you not get these things if you follow the rules? Um, and so I think that, I think, I think that at least if nothing else is a basic model. And again, like we talk about these things in the platform that like, there's a certain point where frankly it is just less expensive to find, you know, to attempt to find and build housing for the unhoused rather than like the social costs and the medical costs and, you know, all the costs that go in associated with the problem of homelessness, like housing the unhoused turns out just to be more efficient and cheaper. Like rather than like waiting for people to commit crimes and then locking them up and paying for their needs, like cover people's needs at the beginning and let them have this ability as you say, because I mean, it's, and again, it, it, it's probably, you know, a, it depends on how people view how people react. But I think I, I am one of those people who thinks that when people are less worried about where their next meal is coming from, you know, they are, they do, there is a tendency to volunteer or to produce something or to, you know, engage people, people by and large sit around and don't do anything from a sense of hopelessness. And I think, you know, being able to remove that saying like, okay, look, we can't guarantee you the most amazing life, but we can do our best to guarantee you, you'll have shelter, you'll have food, you'll have medical care. And then from there, you can start putting your life together. And I think being able to do that for all strata of society is, is significant. And again, like I think multiple parts of, of the CMP platform tie together along with UBI negative income tax to, to accomplish that sort of thing. And yeah, and I just want to add a couple of things there. I think that it would create a lot more entrepreneurs to have that kind of social safety net because if you know you're going to have your basic needs met and you're going to have basic health care, it gives you the freedom to really try and create a business because if you fail, you'll just fall back into this net. Whereas now, you know, I think a lot of people who would create businesses are too afraid of the consequences of failure, which in our society today are profound. And then speaking to this issue of crime and punishment, you know, we're talking about a situation where the, the true social safety net in California and America is prison. And you create uh, a whole bunch of high paying jobs for guards and you create a whole bunch of slave labor jobs for prisoners. And it's created this whole kind of distorted economy. But, you know, studies have been done that it costs about as much to house a prisoner in California as it does to send them to Harvard or to Stanford. 
So, you know, we're really spending a ludicrous sum of money to lock up millions and millions of people whose crimes are usually coming from some kind of social need. And so it's this like ridiculously expensive response to a problem that would be solved way more easily and equitably by simply creating a floor on poverty so that the need to commit crime was eliminated. Uh, and on the entrepreneur part, I'll add on to that. I think the world needs more artists. I think you're promoting art. You know, people can, you know, young, brilliant artists can, can create their artwork, which will, which will make money. But even dot-com people, even people in, in, in the computer industry and technology, if you're in Texas and you have a great idea for a company, you're going to say to yourself, you know what, I could start this in Texas or I can go to California where I will, you know, guaranteed not to be homeless if I fail. Uh, I think this is, a, it's a great way to recruit people to move to California. Let's see, I'm trying to think what else. I don't know what else I would want to add. I think we've really covered a lot of the UBI and negative income tax um, points. Uh, is there anything else you guys would want to add to that, add to what we've talked about? Um, well, I think one, one, uh, one, one, one important aspect of it that we also talk about in the, uh, in the, in the platform uh, and in the economy plank in particular is how this UBI negative income tax uh, winds in uh, with our call for the formation of a California public bank, um, because we we call for the UB, we, you know, we call for the development of a California public bank with accounts for all California residents. Um, you know, this removes the need of you know things like expes expensive check cashing places, uh, which usually are are utilized by people who don't have the financial resources to, you know, get bank accounts and stuff like that. So by giving everybody a bank account in the California public bank, having the UBI and negative income tax refunds go directly into that account. Um, you know, I think it also simplifies the, the financial lives of a lot of, because I mean, part of the issue that we've talked about with the social welfare network is as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's expensive, it's bloated, it's bureaucratic, it's, it's complex, but it's also confusing. And oftentimes when you need access to these government resources, that's exactly the last time in your life, you can go through and figure out a complex, complex web of paperwork and navigate this, you know, this this baroque, uh, you know, kind of bureaucratic system. And I think again, just sort of simplifying things into like, you know, you get a monthly payment, you get a negative income tax. It goes into a bank account that's formed for you in the California National Bank. If you if you have a different account, you can transfer it to somewhere else. But if you don't, you know, it's going right in there. You know, you get essentially something like you know a debit card with your California National Bank account that like, you know, is immediately useful to access this money that you're getting. Um, so again, like, I, I know we uh, uh, definitely, definitely, I know we've talked about UBI negative income tax, and I think that's important, but it's also like, this is, this is one part of kind of like a, a, a holistic program uh, to in essence, try to simplify these matters. Because I think as you said earlier, simplified, you know, fiscally responsible government isn't a left-wing issue. It's not a right-wing issue. It's a good government issue. We, everybody should want our government to be good and efficient and productive. If a government is going to do something, it should do it in the most, you know, cost-effective and direct way possible. And I think this allows for that, whereas the sort of, like, bizarre, bloated bureaucratic system that we have now is inefficient, it's expensive, and it prevents the people who need help from getting it. So I think you know, all these different things combined together, we've talked about like the public bank, Medi-Cal for all, along with UBI and negative income tax, all produce this society that we've been talking about where these sorts of basic worries that are preventable can be can be dealt with. Uh, so that's, that's just the one thing I'm, I would want to add at the end. I'll add one, one more thing. You know, like people do not have a high regard for the government. If you want to get people civically involved and get them happy in the government again, give them money. Give them a UBI and a negative income tax. When I got that $1,200 in the mail for COVID relief, it was probably the happiest I've ever been with the government in my entire life. I finally felt like I wasn't getting screwed, even though I suppose I was, but $1,200 check felt good in my hands. It made me, uh, 
maybe a smidge less cynical. So I think this is with the negative income tax and UBI, it's a good way to get people involved. It's a good way to get people feeling good about California. And um, optimism is something we definitely need in our society. I think the last point that I want to make on it is just that it's a cutting edge policy. So it's, you know, different countries are talking about it. There have been some small experiments, but if we did it soon, we would be the first major economy, the fifth largest economy in the world to pursue this project. And that would have a couple of great impacts. One is that people really look to California to invent the future and us continuing to do that, us continuing to evolve our government in positive ways and evolve our society in positive ways really gives our, our culture this image of progress and power and confidence and success that really defines California as kind of a national brand. And so I think it would continue to grow our brand and increase the value of our brand to implement this cutting edge uh, social technology in, in, the, you know, in the front of the wave. And then also I think some of the states, some of, the, some of our American friends would be inspired by us. So we would alleviate poverty, not only in California, but you know, maybe British Columbia would see the example and really approve of it. Maybe Washington State would. Other places that like to be on the cutting edge, but maybe not the bleeding edge the way that California is. We get that quick. Hawaii, they say, is is close to getting UBI put through. Not with the negative income tax, though. So we'll still. And I've checked with a lot of my UBI friends. Um, none of them have ever heard of combining it with a negative income tax. It's it's got a lot of people interested, a lot of people, you know, percolated like, wow, that is there are like a lot of people say that there are some flaws with the UBI and a negative income tax. But when you combine the two, it's really hard to find a fault in the in the system. Um, and look, it's just an efficient way and a good way. It's good government and it's cutting edge. So here, here to UBI and negative income tax. Yep, I agree. But uh yeah, and, and, and as you say, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting. I feel like it is hopefully one of, those, one of those solutions where kind of like the weaknesses of each side can be, can be somewhat compensated by the strength of the other. And, and, and uh, yeah, I'm hoping, I'm hoping even, you know, obvi obviously I'm hoping everybody who, who hears this is going to be interested in the California National Party and, and wants to learn more about, you know, California, but definitely just uh, hopefully just the idea uh, being out there uh, you know, broadly, you know, hopefully we'll get some people thinking. So yeah, I think you're, I think you're, I think you're both right. And so if people want to see our policies on this, what, uh, where would they need to go online? Uh, so we're going to, like I said, so all that we've been discussing is in our new 2020 platform. Uh, that's going to be, uh, I mean, you, you, you'll, you'll be hearing about it at this very convention. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be, party members will be voting on that uh, starting on August 16th. Uh, and of course, we, we hope that, that our party members will approve it. And then you'll be able to find that platform uh, online at californianational.party uh, slash platform uh, 2020. And um, yeah, you can, you can learn more there. And uh, for those of you, uh, yeah, for those of you who are, who are seeing this and not on our mailing list, you can join our mailing list at the website as well uh, and get in touch with us. We'd be happy to email you uh, a copy of the platform, but it should also be available soon for download on the website. All right. Good stuff, guys. Oh, all right. Well, Bill, thank you for uh, thank you for taking the lead on uh, on on this, and uh, and uh, thanks to uh, thanks to everyone for watching. All right. And please, if you're in the party, vote for this. <laughs> it's a great idea. Well, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the convention. Medi-Cal is currently available to any Californian whose income falls below the federal poverty threshold. But the California National Party believes that Medi-Cal should be available for all Californians, and I would like to tell you why. Approximately one third of Californians, over 13 million people, are receiving Medi-Cal. In some counties, like Merced and Tulare, nearly half the population is served by Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal is currently tied to the federal poverty level, which is income at or below 138% of the federal poverty level. 
California's cost of living clearly makes this standard unfeasible for us because under the current federal guidelines, an individual earning about $18,000 or a family of four earning about $36,000 a year would not currently qualify for Medi-Cal. Given the current pandemic and resulting economic recession, many Californians are having to navigate the Medi-Cal system, often for the first time. Since only those below a certain income are eligible, some people have been forced to make decisions like taking temporary work, which may mean they make too much to qualify for Medi-Cal, and have to buy insurance through Covered California, which actually decreases their take-home pay. The alternative is to remain unemployed simply to qualify for Medi-Cal. These situations show the need for basic medical care to be available to all California residents at all times because during a crisis, it is critically important that all Californians have access to medical care. Medi-Cal for All would also remove a major financial burden on small and medium-sized businesses to provide healthcare coverage for their employees. Businesses would still be able to offer private insurance coverage as an incentive to employees, while smaller businesses, which are more likely to be owned by members of the local community, would be freed of the responsibility of providing health care. So, while those who have health insurance through their employer or through private purchase would likely use those, Medi-Cal for All would assure that every Californian always has access to basic health care, even during times of personal or global catastrophe. Ultimately, the goal of Medi-Cal for All would be to consolidate the complex web of federal agencies that serve different groups of Californians, such as Medicaid, Medicare, the Veterans Administration, Indian Health Service, and others, into a single California healthcare system known as CHS, which will provide services to all Californians. Costly bureaucratic administration will be simplified, and this is in line with the CMP's long-term goal of transferring responsibilities from the United States while reducing our federal tax burden and ensuring that we keep more of our money in California. If you want to know more, please check out our Securing Autonomy section in the Autonomy and Independence Plank of the 2020 platform. The CMP supports Medi-Cal for All based on the principle that our society should assure access to basic healthcare as a civil right. It is also a recognition that California cannot rely any longer on the federal government to provide real solutions for healthcare. Changes in presidential administrations and congressional power leave the healthcare policy of the United States confusing and unstable. Californians deserve predictable and stable access to healthcare and for this, California must rely on itself. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to take uh, a little break now. Uh, you know, let people uh, get up, stretch their legs, not stare at a screen uh, continuously. Although, uh, if you are into that kind of thing, uh, for those of you who are not aware, we do have uh, CMP party members. Uh, who are helming our Twitter and Facebook accounts in real time, so you can communicate with them uh, right now while the while the convention is happening. Uh, ask them questions, make comments, uh, discuss with them how to get more involved with the party. Uh, so yeah, please uh, please feel free to do that. And of course, you can uh, reach out to us after the convention through our contact page on our website, which is www.californianational.party. Uh, so we're just going to take uh, about a 10 minute break uh, and then we'll come back and uh, hear from our candidates for the leadership committee. Uh, so we'll see you in a few.
All right. Welcome back to the second part of the 2020 California National Party Virtual Convention. Uh, with this part of the convention, we will be focusing on speeches by our candidates uh, for the CMP Leadership Committee. So just to give a little bit of background on that, as the name implies, the Leadership Committee is the central organizing group of the California National Party. We, of course, have regional central committees and county central committees in areas where we have a presence, but the leadership committee is the California-wide sort of organizational clearinghouse of the party. It's made up of six members elected for a one-year term. There's a chair, a vice chair, secretary, treasurer, and two regional chapter coordinators, one for Northern California and one for Southern California. So we'll be hearing from candidates for all of those. Appropriately enough, uh, I get to open it. Uh, since my apologies for not formally introducing myself at the beginning of the convention, but my name is Michael Loebs and I'm the current chair of the California National Party and I'm running for re-election. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I've been uh, involved with the party since early 2016. I started as uh, a member of the regional San Francisco Bay Area Council uh, and eventually uh, served for a year as Northern California chapter coordinator before I became chair of, in June of last year. Obviously, 2020 has been a difficult time for growth of the party. There are multiple reasons for this. Probably most importantly was for the end of 2019 and 2020, a lot of voter attention in California was focused on the federal presidential primary. And then, of course, as soon as that passed away, Trump flew. So we've had great difficulty in holding together the in-person network that we had been building up in the tail end of 2019. Our in-person meetups in the Bay Area and Sacramento and other places, obviously, we've stopped for safety reasons. We've been unable to table at major events. And so because of that, we're going to need a new model for growth of the party without in-person contact. Obviously, this is going to involve the usage of social media, but also I wanna make sure that we are able to have more real-time interaction with party members. So I'm hoping to introduce things like regional conference calls, as well as more casual virtual events in which Californians can discuss all the various issues that face us. And I believe that this will be helped by our new 2020 platform which creates a place for solutions to California outside the two-party framework. And as chair of the party, I'm very pleased and proud to have been one of the main organizers of this 2020 platform or vision. As I say, I've been with the party for over four years now, and I've seen the platform grow and evolve, and I think it just keeps getting better and firmer and clearer what our message is and what our ideas are for California. And I think being able to go out into a less in-person community with this statement, which says who we are, what our values are, what our plans and goals are for California, will be absolutely helpful in building a new party base. Because it's important that we show that we have new ideas that can address the problem of California better. This is perhaps the most significant thing we need to do. The California National Party is not merely a social club in which we discuss California. Our goal is to show Californians that as long as we retain this kind of allegiance to the federal two-party system that we've adopted in California, we are never going to be able to communicate as Californians to solve the problems that face us. We will always be stuck in these battles between distant political parties. So what we need and what I think the 2020 platform produces is the ability for us to come together with different kinds of Californians and build a new California-centric party with California-centric goals. And so it is my hope that if I am allowed to continue as chair of the California National Party, that we'll spend the next year reaching out to a broad, diverse spectrum of Californians, that we will, instead of telling them what they want and what they believe. We will listen to what their concerns are. 
to what their issues are, to what their problems are, so that we can form real solutions that are grounded on real human beings instead of mere ideological constructs. And so as party chair, my continued goal will be to bring new and diverse elements of the California population into the California National Party so that we can begin discussing, debating, negotiating, compromising, but working together as Californians to determine how it is that we can best move forward in our goals. And of course, our ultimate goal as the California National Party is California independence. But we cannot simply go to the people of California who are facing real life problems and simply offer them the panacea that when independence comes, everything will be better. We need to show that we are a party with ideas, that we are a party with policy solutions, that we are a party who can lead California into the future. And so with that, I would like to introduce the following five candidates for the leadership committee. We'll be hearing from Theo Slater, candidate for vice chair, Yvonne Hargrove, candidate for secretary, Lyra Porcasi, candidate for treasurer, Bill Scog, candidate for our Northern California chapter coordinator, and Ken Brucker, our candidate for Southern California chapter coordinator. All right, take it away team. Hello, and thank you for attending the California National Party's 2020 annual convention. My name is Theo Slater, and I'm a candidate for the position of vice chairperson. I'll tell you a little about myself. I, along with a few other California patriots, founded the California National Party in 2015. I was the first elected chairperson, and I held that position for several years. I helped set up many of the California National Party's social media outlets. I set up some of its early local chapters and generally helped steer the party for several years. I, most recently, I have been the uh, Northern California local chapter coordinator. And so over the course of the last year, I've been working to build a couple of chapters. Uh, those are still in progress and I intend to continue to help build those chapters as vice chairperson. I'll work with whoever is elected to replace me as the Northern California local chapter coordinator. Uh, the, the main efforts there uh, is we're working on a Central Valley chapter and that's coming along well. And we're also looking at maybe like a, a Vacaville chapter and a couple of others. Another thing that has been a focus uh, recently has been my work on the platform. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that I and many others have done creating the California National Party's 2020 platform. I think it's the best platform this party has ever had, and I think it really shows our maturity as a party. It's very broad, covering a vast array of topics. As vice chairperson, um, I will continue to work with the social media teams, uh, spreading our message, trying to get a more unified message, trying to get a more consistent posting schedule, and really looking at how to build audience specific to each platform. So, you know, what works on Instagram may work not as well on Facebook, may work better on Twitter. These are the kinds of things I want to work on as vice chairperson. Another project I want to work on is to create something like this. This is something created by Cascadia. And what this is, is a kind of a mock passport and it gets it will get our people really thinking about california as a nation and what the cascadians have done is they have sort of different regions represented in their passport and you can get stamps from those regions and so forth and we're going to try and set up a similar thing here uh, and maybe work with them coordinate with them to the degree that it's helpful um, and so i think that's going to be a really exciting project it'll be an opportunity to highlight california's regions our diversity and our continuity, um, our community and our um, magnificent, uh, you know, tableau of multicultural richness that really helps create California as it is. 
because the, one of the greatest strengths of California is that we have people from every part of the world. And that's why we create the future, because we have all of these different perspectives from all of these different parts of the world, all of these dynamic and creative people who've come here, like I did, and chosen California as our home. And the reason we choose it is it's the greatest nation on earth. California has beautiful land, brilliant people, and the kind of forward-thinking culture that will continue to invent the future. Um, the other thing I want to cover is that one thing we really need to focus on going into this election cycle in 2020, not only are we going to help our candidates who we're endorsing um, do well in their various local campaigns, but we also want to be ready for when the election in D.C. is either decided or you know half decided, however, however well or badly that plays out, we need to be able to leverage any opportunities that that situation creates. And looking back at the huge influx of energy and people that we got in 2016, 2020 could be the best year the California National Party has ever had. And I don't know about you, but I'd really like for something I'm involved with to be having its best year right now. It'd be great to get a win here. And there's a real opportunity because particularly if the candidate that is less in tune with California values wins, a lot of Californians are gonna be looking for solutions outside of the status quo because it will represent yet another failure of the status quo and it will really highlight um, the differences between California and our American friends. And honestly, whoever wins, we're, we're gonna have an opportunity because this is a very challenging time in California and in the United States. And that's an opportunity for us to present the people of California with new solutions to these uh, new problems. And so it's a really exciting time to be a part of the California National Party. I encourage you to volunteer your time to help us however you can to push this project forward to help us build the California nation together. And once again, I'm running for vice chairperson. I hope you will, you will vote for me and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yvonne Hargrove and I'm running for re-election as secretary of the California National Party. I support the CMP because California is a place where I see my values of equality and compassion being upheld. These are the values I support. Compassion and decency for all citizens, undocumented, unhoused, unemployed, all citizens deserve the basic human rights of food, shelter, and health care. California has an inclusive culture where we strive to make everyone part of the California story, regardless of their race, religion, sexual orientation, or health status. California is also forward-looking, ceaselessly working to create a better world for all. Over my last two terms as secretary, I have worked hard to support the CMP and its mission. I have organized and overseen leadership committee meetings where I help to facilitate the crafting of important CMP policy documents, including the new party platform. I've taken on a coordination role for the CMP's social media accounts, especially supporting the CMP's main Facebook page and responding to messages from members and inquiries from potential future members. I've taken a role in maintaining the California National Party's Free the Bear store, where members can find many ways to express their CMP pride. I've also helped organize crucial party events, such as this virtual convention. In addition, I respond to any communications members submit to us using the contact us form on the CMP's website, californianational.party. I am proud of the role I have played in growing the CMP's membership and crafting and clarifying our core message. Indeed, communication is my thing, and I, along with other members of the party, will be responding to any questions you may have via Facebook or Twitter during this convention. Since the beginning of COVID, interacting with the public has become harder. However, previously I have tabled for the CMP at events such as the Women's March in Sacramento. I regularly attend my local virtual chapter meetings, shout out to my Sacramento peeps, and enjoy the stimulating conversations and brainstorming for California independence that goes on there. Communicating with CMP members 
is always rewarding to me. I love seeing the enthusiasm and optimism of our members. California's response to COVID has not been perfect, but I am very pleased to see that we acted quickly and independently of the United States. The federal response to COVID has been an excellent example of why California needs to go its own way. We cannot allow ourselves to be manipulated into harming our own citizens for the benefit of a selfish, greedy, unfair, and irresponsible federal government. Although COVID cases are higher in California than we would all like, the number of deaths from this terrible virus is still much lower in proportion to our population than it is in many parts of the United States, thanks to the value that Californians place on science and responsible leadership. A bit about me, many of you know that I'm originally from the state of Alabama. I have seen firsthand what inequality and a lack of social services can do to a state's citizens. Something you may not know about me is that I have a close family member who became homeless and was living on the streets in San Francisco a few years ago. The compassionate mental health services and homeless shelters available saved her life. I've said it before and I will say it again, but I'm happy to pay my taxes in California where I see a, see a real commitment to making California work for all its residents and where the values of equality and compassion are central to our way of life. California has the infrastructure, economy, and intelligence to operate independently of the United States, and we are recognized as a global player. So I hope you will give me your vote and allow me to continue to serve in this most important fight. Together, let's free the bear. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and for your support of the California National Party. In my first year of being national treasurer for this party, my speech was all about letting you get to know me on a personal level. It was all about my values and my reasons for becoming so deeply involved in this cause. If it had been at all possible, those ideals have leaned even more progressively since. In the second year, my speech was designed to be humorous, a bit lighter in tone, and illustrated the many faults of politicians in general. I aimed to differentiate myself from your typical politician. This year, I had a lot of trouble coming up with a speech that would equal or surpass the other two in both content and audience engagement, saying, please vote for me because I know how to do the party's taxes. Seems slightly pathetic. Ask me about taxes and compliance forms and I'll answer you with accurate business-like efficiency. Ask me about what the party means to me and you're in for an emotionally charged rant that will have you backing toward the door while throwing Hershey bars to distract me. So, in the spirit of the main goal of the party, Californian independence, I'm going to aim my speech in that direction. Whenever I'm asked what my favorite holiday is, I don't say the usual ones that you might suspect, like Christmas or Thanksgiving or my birthday. This is mostly because many of the holidays on the current calendar are either based in religion, marking historical slaughter and oppression, or reminding me that I'm getting older. No, I always answer the 4th of July, Independence Day. This is the only holiday that represents freedom from the sovereignty of a country that no longer shared the values of those declaring the independence. Thus, when California is officially declared independent from the United States, I am here and now putting forth a petition to have that day given national holiday status on the future calendars of the nation of California. But until that day comes, I figured that a wonderful way to express my pride in being a native Californian is to discuss several things that you may or may not know about this wonderful nation state. First, did you know that California's name is derived from a best-selling novel? In 1510, Spanish author Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo penned Las Sergas de Esplandian, the, de the Deeds of Esplandian, a novel in which Amazon-like warriors who lived on the island of California, a paradise that abounded in gold and precious stones, aided the protagonist Esplandian. The story was so popular that when Spanish explorers under the command of Hernán Cortés landed on what they believed to be an island on the Pacific coast, 
They named it California after Montalvo's mythical island. Since I believe that California has been an island for quite some time now, a moral, political, and economical island, I find the origin of our name completely and happily appropriate. Second, did you know that Sacramento wasn't California's original state capital? When California entered the Union in 1850, San Jose served as its initial state capital, but legislature, legislators quickly grew dissatisfied with their accommodations and in 1852 accepted an offer to move 60 miles north to Vallejo. To the lawmaker's surprise, however, they arrived in Vallejo to find their new home still under construction. After an unsuccessful week of trying to do business amid the din of construction, California's le legislators moved inland to Sacramento to complete their session. After a brief return to Vallejo and stop in Benicia, the state capital finally settled permanently in Sacramento in 1854. Now, I don't know if we'll have either the chance or the desire to change the placement of our capital once we gain independence, seeing as we have lots of other more important things to do, as outlined in our platform, but you never know. Third, did you know that California once declared itself an independent country for a month? On June 14, 1846, American settlers in Sonoma rose up against the Mexican authorities who governed the territory and declared the establishment of the independent California Republic. The rebels fashioned a makeshift flag with a lone red star and a crude drawing of a grizzly bear. Unbeknownst to the leaders of what became known as the Bear Flag Revolt, however, the United States had already declared war on Mexico, and when American Commodore John D. Sloat seized Monterey and raised the American flag over the city, the rebels gave up their notion of independence only weeks after it began and declared their allegiance to the United States. I have three words to say about this one, big effing mistake. But I suppose at the time they didn't realize how utterly horrible the United States would become in the next 175 years. Fourth, did you know that the grizzly bear on the California state flag was modeled after one captured by William Randolph Hearst? In 1889, newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst dispatched one of his journalists, Alan Kelly, to capture him a wild grizzly bear that he could put on display in San Francisco. Although Kelly had no hunting experience, he managed to lead an expedition that netted his boss an elusive grizzly which had all but disappeared from the state by that time. Hearst named the 1,200-pound animal Monarch and put him on display in San Francisco's Woodward's Gardens. After Monarch died in 1911, his pelt was stuffed and put on display at the California Academy of Sciences. When California decided that same year to honor the Bear Flag Revolt by replicating the Rebels' banner, Monarch served as a model for illustrators. The grizzly bear is now extinct in California. So that sucks for the grizzly, and it only further cements my support of one of our slogans, free the bear. Fifth, did you know that slavery nearly split California in two soon after it achieved statehood? California entered the Union as a free state under the Compromise of 1850. Pro-slavery Southerners who had moved into the southern half of the state, however, advocated for seceding from California and forming their own state in which slavery would be legal. The secessionists gained the support of Spanish-speaking residents who thought the state's tax and land laws unfair. In 1859, the state legislature passed an act signed by Governor John B. Weller that would have broken off the area of the state south of the 36th parallel as the territory of Colorado. More than 75% of voters in the proposed territory approved the measure. However, congressional authorization needed for the measure to take effect never came, and the matter faded away with the outbreak of the Civil War. Okay, so for those who don't have the degrees of latitude on Earth mapped out in their heads, everything south of the 36th parallel includes the counties of San Luis Obispo, Kern, Santa Barbara, San Bernardino, Ventura, Los Angeles, San Diego, Orange, Riverside, and Imperial. Here is one failure of Congress that I am never going to lament. Sixth, 
Did you know that during the Civil War, Californians marched to Texas to fight Confederate rebels? In 1862, the 1,500 men of the California Column, who volunteered for the Union cause, embarked on a march east to push back Confederate rebels from Texas who had crossed over into the territory of New Mexico. On a 900-mile trek to El Paso, Texas, the Californians skirmished with both Confederate rebels and Apache warriors under the command of Cochise. The advance of the California Column caused the Texans to retreat, and the Union forces occupied towns and forts in West Texas to keep them at bay. Hell yes, we did. I can barely stay on my elliptical for 30 minutes, but I would march 900 miles to get those idiots away from my country, too. Seventh, did you know that California has both the highest and lowest point in the continental United States? The snow-capped summit of Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the contiguous United States at 14,505 feet, is just under 85 miles away from... Badwater Basin in Death Valley National Park, the lowest point in North America at 282 feet below sea level. Now, I wouldn't personally want to go to either one of those places since I prefer that my skin stays on my body instead of being either burned or frozen off. But hey, go California! Eighth, did you know that dead people are no longer welcome in San Francisco? When land became more precious and concerns about public health increased in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century, the city outlawed burials. In 1912, San Francisco went a step further and evicted its dead. Many of them were moved to the adjacent municipality of Colma, where today the deceased residents outnumber the living ones by over a thousand to one. The rubble of San Francisco's old tombstones is still being used in civic construction projects. I always knew there was something terribly wrong with all of those one-way streets. Now we know where not to be in the event of a zombie apocalypse. Ninth, did you know that oil built Los Angeles? A half century after the discovery of gold and silver caused the population of California to boom, Huge oil fields were discovered underneath the small town of Los Angeles in the 1890s. By 1930, a forest of oil derricks dotted the Los Angeles area, and the state was pumping one quarter of the world's petroleum output. According to the Los Angeles Daily News, there are still more than 3,000 active oil and gas wells in Los Angeles County, many of them operating in the middle of residential neighborhoods and retail developments. I can offer personal testimony on this one. On a trip to Legoland last year, which is in Carlsbad, we stopped at an In-N-Out in Los Angeles for dinner. There was literally a moving, functioning pump jack, you know, one of those horse-looking things that extract oil, in the parking lot right next to the drive through My seven-year-old was thrilled to see one of those up close. So. I hope I've given everyone some interesting California trivia to impress your friends and family with at your next party. We live in an amazing nation and we should be shouting it to the entire universe. I have also been a co-founder of a brand new charity called United Divisions of California. I am the treasurer for that organization as well. And we do many great things, including collections for the homeless, rallies and events for basic and human equal human rights, and fighting for religious freedom and fairness for all. It has been and will continue to be a great honor and privilege to serve the California National Party in the best way that I know how, as national treasurer. And with that, I will end this speech, which has already lasted longer than the employment of some White House staffers. For California, thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Skog. I'm running for chapter coordinator of Northern California. I was born in Massachusetts, but grew up in rural New Hampshire. My dad, um, his side of the family, fought at the Battle of Lexington and Concord. My mom's side, a French Canadian, um, directly related to a man by the name of Guillaume Matteo Dumas, who was a Frenchman who helped in the American Revolution. So you could say I was kind of born into the revolution. And uh, I always considered myself a New Englander more than an American. Um, 
I've worked after college. I worked in professional boxing. I hosted a radio show in Boston. I also did a lot of bo odds and ends in the promotion industry. If you guys think that politics is corrupt and filled with strange people, you should really look into professional boxing. A lot of similarities, though, between like promoting an event and such. Um, my wife and I, we eventually moved to Florida. Um, we eventually moved just because we didn't like it. Lack of economic opportunities. Um, the governor, Rick Scott, at the time refused to get federal matching federal funds for a light speed rail from Orlando to Tampa. That would have been a great boom for the economy because it was Obama. And he didn't want to help Obama. And my wife, when we were trying to get a house, even though she was the predominant breadwinner, she had to get me to sign on the mortgage because she was a woman. And we thought enough is enough. And we decided to, to head west to California. And we've, we've loved it ever since. Um, out here, I worked for a nonprofit teaching kids how to play chess. Um, now, um, I am a stay-at-home dad. I have two kids, one of whom is nonverbal autistic. So he does take up a lot of my time. Um, doesn't sleep well. So I spend a lot of my time with him. I definitely have a lot of time for the party, though. I think that's one of my, my assets. The reasons I joined the party... One of the most influential books in my life was The Nine Nations of North America by Joel Garreau. It's a good book. It talks about how America really culturally, economically, socially, any way, it's really just, a, it's not one whole country. And I think we can, as people in the California National Party, can clearly see that. Um, in 2016, I voted for Gary Johnson and Bill Weld. Um, my rationale was that two Republican governors who ran Democratic states and did all right would be a great compromise for our country that I saw was just filled with hate and anger. And turns out I was wrong. They got less, less than 5% of the vote. But if you look now, this country is just filled with hate from the left and right. You can't escape it on Twitter, Facebook, wherever you are. There's at least five videos a day of people just hating each other. And... I got to be honest, as a person, even though I voted for Johnson and Weld, I see myself as a progressive primarily with a streak of libertarianism, kind of like Tulsi Gabbard's hair. Um, the far right is winning in this country. And as a chess player, I, I train myself to look um, moves and steps ahead. And the only way I see this ending is through separation. We just, as Americans, we hate each other. And I don't want it to end violently. I'd rather have a, a good divorce where we can all be free and happy to do what we want. Uh, so that's, that's really the reason I've joined the party is I, I don't see, I don't see a good, I don't see a happy ending. What I think I can do to help the party, uh, first of all, I've been doing a, a podcast. Uh, little by little, Forbes and I are getting better at it. We're getting better guests. We're, we're hoping to make it a, a big uh, platform for us. Um, before I, I, I started volunteering with the party, um, for the reasons of wanting unification, uh, I was a, a supporter of Andrew Yang's. I was one of his first 10 to 100 volunteers. And what I, why I think that matters is I saw a nothing campaign um, when I started, he was in 23rd place. They wouldn't even put him in most polls. And I saw it grow to uh, doing better than Kamala Harris, several governors, several other senators and representatives. So I, I've seen what it takes to, to grow a campaign. And as I mentioned before, I have the time to do this. I, I really, truly do. I, I'm willing to devote almost all my time and effort to it. My goals if, as chapter coordinator for Northern California is to reach out to the northern counties, the rural areas. Um, I want to reach out to disenfranchised voters, people who have given up on the democratic process. I want to reach out to open-minded libertarians, telling them about propor proportional voting and how in a California, in an independent California nation, they would get more of a voice 
than they would in America. Even people in the state of Jefferson, I think it was Theo who told me, you know, does the state of Jefferson want to be in a small Idaho? Do they want to be the a mix of Rhode Island and Idaho? They would have more of a voice in a, in a, California, a California nation. The other thing I want to do is I want to reach out to, the, to our brothers and sisters in the balkanization movements, be it New England Independence Party, and even more importantly, because they're so much closer to us, the Cascadia movement, who I think we can all agree has a very infectious, um, passionate base, and they do a very good job of, of creating a social media presence, um, just getting known in general. And I want to kind of steal some of their thunder and work with them um, to create a joyous movement and to make California the nation that it already is. So thank you for your consideration. Hi, I'm Ken Brucker. I am chairman of the Central Committee of the California National Party in San Diego County, and I'm also chapter coordinator of nine counties in Southern California. So what I'm doing, it, I'm talking to you in San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Ventura, San Bernardino, Riverside, Orange, Imperial, and San Diego counties is if I can get your vote to have one more term as the chapter coordinator for your counties. Uh, there's no way to hide from it. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic has really thought, put a lot of the plans that I had and threw them into the ditch. So my plan is to move on and to try and plan to plan. Our contact management system needs some work. I gotta be able to figure out a way to one, look you up, talk to you, make notes on our conversation, and move on and do it all over again with the, the next person on our list. We can't do that right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be finding people to put together a plan to fix that. They said it was lack of imagination that kept a lot of the US federal officials from imagining that there would be a terrorist attack on 9-11. Nobody imagined that the worst thing could happen. I kind of think that the re-election of Donald Trump might be the same same thing. You know, four more years of him in the White House would really put, it'd throw, it'd throw a wrench into all the U.S. Not just California, not just the cruel and sadistic things that he says about our undocumented neighbors, but the whole nation. What, he's, what he said he would do to the undocumented neighbors he's doing to anybody who is vulnerable to the coronavirus. He's doing it to the whole hospital and healthcare industry. So we got to prepare to go make our own plans and to go and do make our own way and separate. So a lot of people don't think that uh, the U.S. is going to make it. And otherwise, we got to plan to go and still go our own way. If we have somebody who might be more competent and a little bit more benevolent, you know, because he's still from the same party that didn't have the brains and the foresight and got it together to keep that guy out of the White House. So with your support, I'm going to build towards that goal. All right. Well, thank you, candidates, uh, both for your speeches and for the work that all of you have already put into the California National Party. Uh, so for those of you who are on the California National Party mailing list, you should be receiving an email soon, which will give you a link allowing you to vote uh, for the leadership committee candidates, as well as on the 2020 platform. If you are not on our mailing list, you can contact us through social media to gain access, or you can uh, contact us through our website, www. Dot California National dot party, uh, which is also where you can sign up for the mailing list. Uh, so you should uh, all be getting an email on that uh, by the time the convention ends. Uh, so we're going to take uh, another brief break for about 10 minutes, uh, let everybody uh, clear their digital heads a little bit. Uh, and we come back, uh, we'll discuss uh, party building and uh, the future of the California National Party. So see you in a few minutes.
All right. Welcome back to the third and final segment of the California National Party's 2020 virtual convention. Uh, in this section, we will be discussing party building and how we can talk about issues important to Californians and show them the benefits of a California-centric policy. Uh, two people we're going to hear in regard to this uh, are Sean Forbes, uh, one of the creators of the Free the Bear podcast, which some of you may be familiar with. And we'll also hear from Ken Brucker, our Southern California chapter coordinator, on the failures of U.S. immigration policy and how we in California can do better. To conclude this section, we're also going to hear from a group that the CMP has long sought to emulate in our party building strategy, and that's the Scottish National Party. Like them, the CMP is constitutionalist, we reject unilateral action toward independence, and we support a process of devolution from the central governmental authority, in our case, the United States, in the case of the SNP, the United Kingdom. And as part of this devolution, we work as a party to seek and gain greater autonomy on the path to independence. Like them, we emphasize the importance of local politics with local accountability, and it is combined with a national identity that is nonetheless open to new people, new cultures, and new ideas. So our friends at the Scottish National Party have sent us a presentation about their organizing and party building, which will be presented by CMP member Theo Slater. And I think more than ever now, it is important to remember that this struggle by the Scottish National Party, which has borne so much fruit and is likely to lead to Scottish independence in the future, has been a long, arduous process that's been in action for a century. The party itself originated from a union between parties that had elements of left and right politics, but were united in their devotion to a Scottish-based party and a Scottish-based politics. One of the primary reasons the SNP has succeeded is because it offers a broader message than simply independence. And that's an example that we in the CMP strive to follow. And as much as I understand the importance of independence, to be honest, I find it hard to believe that anyone could want California independence more than I, although I certainly hope many of you listening are thinking the same things about yourself. But I'm a lifelong California native. I'm a child of California natives. I've lived my entire life in California. My family is in California. This is my home. America has never really meant much to me. So independence is very important to me but our messaging needs more. And we need to recognize that independence is not just about joining a Facebook group or collecting petition signatures. It is a complex, ongoing process. And the California National Party believes that we need a strong party to support this movement. And this will take a great deal of work. But to be successful, we have to be realistic about what this work will entail. And these lessons from the Scottish National Party will help us to remember that. Before we begin that, however, much as last year, uh, we're going to have an announcement about a California National Party survey so we can learn more about our membership. And uh, just to get that started, here's David to tell you more about that. Hi everyone, my name is David Leskier. I'm here to talk about this year's survey for supporters of independence. Those of you who were present at the 2019 convention in Santa Monica, um, you probably have participated in a demographic survey on the CMP website. This year, the survey has moved to an independent website. Um, this was done mainly uh, so that I could have access to the data more readily, as well as open it to a more neutral environment for everyone who's not a member of CNP, but supports independence. So I'm gonna show you how to access this new website. So you're gonna open up any browser, and in the URL bar, you're gonna enter carepublic.info. That's going to take you to this web page, or at the top where the head of this 
mountain climber is. It'll say, take the current survey when your mouse is above it. And just go ahead and click on it. It'll open up a new tab with the census form on it. Um, I'm gonna go over some stuff about the census. So it's designed to not gather personally identifiable data. Um, so that means we're not collecting your name, phone number. The closest thing we get to an address is we ask you what county you live in, um, just so we can have county by county uh, information, <clears throat> as well as we're not collecting any donation information for the CMP or any other independence organization. We don't solicit donations from this form. Um, there is a caveat, all questions are required to participate, except for the suggestion box at the end. However, there will always be a prefer not to answer choice for every question. We, we have to have you answer every question, even if you put prefer not to answer, because when we put the data into a spreadsheet, uh, the formulas work better for tabulation if we have a value for it. So you, we really just need your help in adding a value, even though you'll, it, it won't impact the results. So like I said, we're not collecting any personally identifiable data. Uh, no addresses, no phone numbers, no names. Um, it is used on Google Forms. So any information collected by Google is collected by Google. Um, you can use an incognito window um, that should help with data collection. We don't release any information Google collects, nor do we really have access to it. Um, we don't collect any information. We do not track you on the website. Um, as per our privacy policy and data collection policy, which is available at the bottom near all these links for social media for the CNP, Yes, California, and Independent California. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at independentstats.california at gmail.com. If you use the comment or message box here, it does take a little bit longer because it goes through Wix. Um, so it takes a little bit longer to reach my inbox, but I will always get back to you. I will especially be active during this convention. Those of you who took last year's convention survey, uh, if you go to the document section, it has the results, which you can download. They're in spreadsheet form for the aggregate data, which is basically a list of everyone who answered in their answers. It does not have any personally identifiable data on it. Um, so it's, it's set up similar to the data we collect for this year's survey, as well as kind of a write-up version of it that puts it into words, um, explaining why we might have receive that data. So once again, please take the survey. You don't have to be in California to take the survey. If you're a supporter, uh, please fill it out. Please let all your friends and family who are support independence take it. The more people we have, the more representative it is, and the more reliable we can say the data is. Um, so please, participate and share. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me to speak to the 2020 convention. As a co-host of the Free the Bear podcast, along with Bill Skog, I very much enjoy talking about the issues of California and how we can combat the abuse and incompetence of the Washington, D.C. government that has pushed us towards independence, something that most of us never wanted or could never contemplate in our lifetimes. But the events of history of March forward and we have to contemplate something that we could never ever imagine before. DC and the ruling class has pushed it to it. I do find absolute joy in knowing that we have others who think the same, who want the same thing as me. A fresh start, a new country, and hopefully a better world. 
and that we need to break away from the United States in order to preserve the original spirit of the United States. Our job as a party is to help the people of California come together and get on the lifeboat that is the state of California, just as the Titanic of the United States sinks into the abyss of corruption and COVID-19. Oddly, in the age of masks, the mask is off, and we now see the true face of our federal government that can no longer hide behind its propaganda. And the true nature of our federal government is that it's composed of incompetent gangsters, trust fund babies, neo-Nazis, morons, immoral cowards who care nothing about our general welfare. Take, for example, billionaire capitalist bloodsucker Elon Blood Diamond Musk, boldly stating on Twitter that the political and economic system of the U.S. capitalists can overthrow any government they want in reference to the coup in Bolivia. He's one example of the sort of ugliness that pretends to be legitimate, and no media organization has taken him to task for that ugly statement. Take, for example, wannabe dictator Trump, touting an absolute quack who mentions demon sperm when it comes to COVID-19. Take, for example, the use of mercenaries to suppress the protests in Portland, Oregon. The list goes on and on, but there could be no doubt the simple image of a peaceful, loving republic that would base its decisions on shrewdness and compassion has gone out the proverbial window. The life, the ship of the, of the American Union has run into the iceberg of reality, and it's time to take to the lifeboats. California is not a utopia by any means, or by any stretch of the imagination. But California independence is a legitimate road towards something better, the last exit before we get on the highway of fascism and slavery. California gives birth to what the rest of the United States talks and brags about. All roads lead to California, in the end. Let us talk about Hollywood, Silicon Valley, wine country, that we are the breadbasket of the United States. What America brags about as a whole, California actually brings to the table. Most of the time when people talk about America overseas, they're really talking about California. Where did the last great American movie come from? Was it Oklahoma or Hollywood? Where did the last great food trend come from? Was it Toledo or Napa? We're the fifth largest economy in the world, but we're treated by the rest of the nation as if we have nothing offered but beaches and wine. Think of the economic weight of Hollywood and Silicon Valley versus the products of Canada and Australia. We are bigger than Canada and Australia in everything, yet we are kept in the shadows by anti-science and anti-common sense groups that generally have a disdain for humanity. The economy of California is the largest in the United States, boasting a 3.2 trillion gross state product as of 2019. If California were a sovereign nation, it would rank as the world's fifth largest economy, ahead of India, but behind Germany. We are a nation state of achievers, and we are being held back by our political system. We have little say in the Senate, the most important body in the United States government outside the presidency itself. In the Senate, we get two votes, and we are a place bigger than Australia and Canada, and much bigger than Alaska, Wyoming, Montana, South Carolina, Alabama, Vermont, etc., etc. All of those states get two votes each in the Senate. Here's a fun fact. The population of Los Angeles County is larger than every state with the exceptions of California, Texas, Florida, New York, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Georgia, and North Carolina. Now for a simple question, how many senators does Wyoming get in representation? Two. How much does the entire state of California that's bigger than Australia and Canada? Two. How many senators does Los Angeles County get? Zero. We are being held back. 
President Lyndon Baines Johnson once crudely explained the difference between the Senate and the House of Representatives in political power as the difference between chicken salad and chicken you know what. Yet the Senate is making rules for Californians as if we are a small backwards colony who cannot run a single thing. In the American political system, we don't have that much of a say, but we have to pay for the system. We pay in blood and we, play in, we pay in taxes. To have such a small body rule on every measure at every time is undemocratic and obscene to modern democratic practices throughout the entire world. But here we are in California, waiting to hear what the Senate has to say, agonizing over their next decision. The same goes for the Supreme Court, an even smaller body, one where every member is there for life. How many times do we agonize over the next Supreme Court decision that could ruin the lives of many Californians? The Senate sends our tax money to red states, which will be honest, these are apartheid states. Ones that are continually fighting against voting rights, the rights of women, the rights of minorities, and then tells us how we cannot do certain things with our own money and that somehow our state is un-American. We are being lectured to and controlled by those who mock our values and mock our democracy itself. These are the people who think COVID-19 is a hoax and Donald Trump, that lying pimp of a president, stands for good government and Christianity. The Senate, composed of a majority of these red states, looks at us, the fifth largest economy, as a cash cow that can be milked to support a $732 billion military industrial complex or whatever new tax cut for the rich that can be dreamed up or whatever police budget needs more fattening. Does this country need a $732 billion defense budget? Do the rich like Jeff Bezos, who is worth $193 billion, and the deceased Jeffrey Epstein need another round of tax cuts so they can buy more super mansions and super yachts and private islands and private planes? When China itself has a defense budget of only $178 billion, which is less than one Jeff Bezos, and is the second largest economy in the world, and is the only country that can be considered a true competitor to the USA, I would say no, we don't need this. When Russia's defense budget is a whopping $65 billion, I would say no again. We are paying for defense companies to be profitable, not for the defense of the country. We don't pay our soldiers a living wage. We don't really pay for defense. We pay for defense contracts. We pay so Dick Cheney and company can have their stocks go up a quarter of a point. Every dollar in defense we are paying is making sure we are not paying for the $20 billion to cure homelessness in the United States or to end hunger in the United States for $25 billion. In California, we know families and loved ones go homeless and hungry every day. We don't have much say about how to treat that in the United States Senate. And let's be honest. It's not that D.C. has really cared about any working-class people since the 1960s. Most of Congress today is composed of people we probably wouldn't trust around our silverware or our children. We are paying taxes to a one-party system masquerading as a two-party system in Washington, D.C. The Senate and the Democrats and the Republicans always have money for modern warfare but fight tooth and nail over hundreds of dollars to everyday Americans. We aren't paying for Californians to be taken care of. We're paying tribute to Wall Street, just like the peasants of old would pay tribute to a king. Never before has much been showcased in American history that could not be considered anything but absolute political decline. Though, of course, the crimes of the United States should not be news to anyone with a barely working understanding of history. The United States is in terminal decline, much like a cancer patient, stage 4, under the last round of chemo, that the patient takes not because of a feeling that things will really turn around, 
but because the show must grimly go on. A nation that cannot care for its people, as the pandemic has shown, that has a government that is more of a front for organized crime, is one that cannot continue and should not continue as is. The United States decline is on a historical scale. The nation has already experienced a round of deaths that ravel uh, a world war in the number of casualties. The nation is already looking down the barrel of Great Depression 2.0, with millions of potential evictions on the horizon because no one has savings. This all could have been avoided, but due to an electoral college that ignored the votes of Californians, in the end of 2016, we really didn't have a say. We had to listen to these other states and look at how they're handling things. We had to go along, basically by force, with a mob of right-wing inbreds who dragged us from one crisis to another. What is to be done, to quote a famous Russian revolutionary? What can we do during a certain time when the proverbial national plane is crashing? The one thing we can do is to recognize first that the danger can no longer be disguised. Yes, these United States do not care for the poor. Otherwise, it would not be haggling over hundreds of dollars per person as opposed to the billions being paid out in bailout money that can't even be properly traced by its own treasury. Yes, we spent too much on defense. And yes, we are failing to combat COVID-19. The body count tells us the truth the government doesn't want to say. In the aviation industry, a common phrase shared amongst pilots is the first step to surviving a plane crash is to understand your plane is crashing. The danger is real. The clock is ticking. The margin of error is tiny. Let us remember certain facts. Yes. A national strategy to combat the pandemic was abandoned because entitled scumbags like Jared Kushner, the son-in-law of Trump, said that only blue states run by Democratic governors were being hit by the virus, and thus not worthy of support and easy targets of political blame. There is no union for California to break away from. When the central government finds it ideal to let parts of its own population die of disease, the social contract was already ripped apart. When criminals like Kushner and Trump thought blue states weren't worth saving, the union is already in shreds. As mentioned earlier, yes, we do have billionaires like government sponge Elon Musk who are openly bragging about coups supported by our country in order to steal the resources of another country and to murder those who stand in its way. That's an American policy, not a policy of California. No one in California would vote for a coup in Bolivia to seal lithium supplies. The Assembly, the State Senate, the Governor did not sign off on any of that. Yes, we do have secret police in the streets of Portland who are armed mercenaries. These are American mercenaries on our streets. Say what you will about Sacramento, but no one in state government signed off on that. These immoral pigs follow the orders of even bigger pigs in D.C. Yes, the commander-in-chief is supporting insanity. His son-in-law is a brutal crook who thought more of how to hurt political opponents than to save lives. We didn't vote for Trump, but the Union gave us Trump. The idea of the United States as we are told about as children does not match up with what we see today. In this age of masks, the mask has come off. We see the face of the beast. What is to be done? History rarely has been kind enough to the incisive and the hesitant. The local mob of history has started up and will result in either one of two things. As Frederick Engels once said, bourgeois society stands at the crossroads. It will either transition to socialism or regression into barbarism. While these words were speaking many years ago, it seems as apt today as it did during the 19th century. America was already floundering even before the horror of COVID-19. Obama's time in charge was one of drone strikes and half measures. It was administration that tried to mask all of the nonsense coming out of the federal government 
by having a present that looked and sounded the part. Sort of like a fictional West Wing present come to life. But that was a mask. It was just a mask. I would reword and modify that quote from Engels and state that California society states at a California society stands at a crossroads with either a transition towards independence or fascism. Portland already has a sneak preview of what the future of America has in store. The kids in the, deca- in the detainment camps already know the value system of the United States. And all their crime was was that their families were poor and they were trying to leave a violent place. Whatever illusions about the modern United States died in an ICE containment camp along with how many other nameless kids. I said in an article once before that I wrote that we should vote for Joe Biden. I believe that to be true as every vote against Trump delegitimizes his administration and is a moral rejection of the sort of government excess he has presided over. But a vote for Joe isn't that much better. I once compared it to chemotherapy compared to cancer. No one wants chemotherapy, but definitely no one wants cancer. And nobody would choose chemotherapy in the right mind for any positive reasons. And any normal person would make sure that if they were diagnosed with cancer in the future, they would do anything possible to make sure that cancer would never come back. California being independent is our best bet to never let this sort of cancer happen again. We cannot talk about saving the country as a whole when so much of the population is ready to destroy it. But we actually can talk about saving California. We can vote for independence. It's time to rise up. The plane is crashing. Something needs to be done. And the only solution is a movement of the people to take back control of our lives. And we can do that by starting a new California Republic. The federal government is broken and done. Right-wing radicals and crypto-Nazis wish to drag us back into the 1950s. Let's cut them out of our lives forever. Let us be independent. Thank you so much for your time. Again, God bless you and God bless California. Hi, I'm Ken Brucker. I'm in San Diego. I'm going to talk to you about immigration. There's plenty of myths that have been uh, asserted and bandied about inside of uh, mass media about immigrants and immigration. And if you look at any of it, it's actually been on the decline. They haven't been taking away jobs. And immigrants, undocumented and otherwise, are not necessarily criminals. Any worse than native-born or um, legally immigrated um, residents of the U.S., and as recently as 2019, late last year, when we, we didn't even think about the pandemic, um, all people of all, all representatives of all parties uh, didn't support uh, immigration reform. Um, Hillary Clinton, when she got beat by Barack Obama the first time in 2008, pulled on sanctuary citizens. She found that everybody, uh, everybody kind of opposed it. People should not... They kind of equate like, you know, you should pay your taxes and you shouldn't immigrate illegally, supposedly. So it continues on. When it, in 2018, the New York Times did an article uh, about uh, immigration reform and they talked to Congress about it. And they, people that members of Congress didn't feel good about it. And in uh, December 2019, NBC News wrote an article about it. And Congress still kind of had cold hands about it. So when you and I think about doing a fix and fixing immigration, getting an immigration system together that's going to work, that's going to make things happen, that isn't going to criminalize people for coming to the U.S. It's not something, it's not a discussion that we can actually have with a lot of the United States. So because Congress would do nothing for our undocumented neighbors, Barack Obama put together something for children brought here uh, as undocumented immigrants, and that we know as DACA, for the Dreamers. An executive order is, you know, it's something. It's a little bit like a temporary structure. It's not a complete house. It's more like a a trailer. And uh, 
this trailer has been attacked pretty savagely in the courts, but it's stood up so far. And I think that we owe it just to just to one man who sta- who was the uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice, uh, John John Roberts Jr. And it's only because of one man's uh, wisdom that many of our neighbors, kids who are in college, kids who live in Southern California, get to stay. But it doesn't replace the necessity or the thing that they're looking for, which is citizenship. So they don't have to worry. And they have full full rights to get educations, to work, and to carry on living at normal lives like anybody else here in in California. So we're left with exe- this an executive order, and that's just the nature of executive orders. You can write a lot of, you can make all kinds of rules and judgments with executive orders. Uh, the thing about executive orders is that sometimes they're just meant to do nothing and just sound good. Um, t- take something that Trump signed nearly two years ago, uh, EO uh, 13847, Strengthening Retirement Security in America. Sounds good to make it safer or give more devices or instruments to save money if the economy is working for people working. That is to say, wages and compensation for jobs in general are rising for workers and the standard of living is not outpacing it rapidly as it has been. Since the Reagan administration, wages have been pretty flat and the economy and the cost of living it just keeps it just keeps rising without people safe policing for communities just about two weeks after george floyd was killed um it sounds like a good thing but first of all you have to have police agencies admitting that there is a problem before they can go to the justice department to ask for a grant to fix these problems politics with politics going on and lots of players going on that most people aren't watching, you're going to see a whole lot of nothing going on. And then lastly, there is are the one and the three that is probably the most well known, Executive Order 1394, building, building and rebuilding monuments to American heroes. It's in reaction to the monuments coming down in Richmond, Virginia. People talk about history being. Uh, erased when the monuments come down yeah well there's always books so there that's what you get for executive orders daca has done a fair job but the thing is is just that it does not give people citizenship so we need to find something else that's going to work because i don't think the u.s is going to fix citizenship for our na- undocumented neighbors the california national party's 2020 platform puts it like this. The immigration policy of the United States under which California is currently obligated to operate is causing irreparable harm to the families of our undocumented neighbors as they are ripped from their homes, detained indefinitely, without legal recourse, and too often sent back to countries that they barely know. This broken system has also caused us economic harm as farmers and other businesses and off the top of my head i'm thinking about restaurants we're talking about construction we're talking about all kinds of domestic services we're talking about health care they all struggled to find workers to replace the productive and hard-working employees that are often abruptly and indiscriminately deported by the federal government There's no adequate path to citizenship for the many undocumented people who have lived in California as law-abiding, productive community members for years. Nor does the federal government provide enough visas for temporary guest workers to keep up with the demands of our economy. This kind of immigration enforcement does not serve the interests of California. For at least 200 years, California has been an important destination for international immigration and any California government will honor the fact that the people from around the world come here to begin new lives as Californians. The California National Party recognizes that California's history includes episodes of xenophobia, intolerance, and we are committed to not repeating the mistakes of that past. 
also from the CNP's 2020 platform is this section. We support the design and implementation of immigration policies that are consistent with the fair and humane treatment of immigrants. No matter how immigrants came to California, they're human beings and deserve to be treated as such. We can't keep taking cues from people in, in a Dakota or Carolina or Virginia who do not share our values and who do not understand or appreciate our neighbors, the people who we live with and who we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, they might be different from us on the outside and have different customs and speak a different language and have very different ethnicity. They are still our neighbors and we live with them and we live alongside them, not in our houses, maybe not in our streets and are on the same block, but they still live in California and we work together and we, we work together and we live together and we, together we build the world's fifth largest economy. They have to be free, they have to be healthy to be able to be productive. We've got some of the top academic institutions. We've got some incredible biotech businesses. We have other high-tech businesses and we've got all kinds of great industries and we need people to keep coming in to make that, make those industries pop. California's unique global position allows it to welcome and cultivate diverse peoples and cultures from all over the planet. And for this reason, the CNP advocates for the implementation of new policies. Independence isn't going to come soon enough for a lot of us in the party. And it might take a while for you to get used to the idea of supporting it. If you want to, we know that we need to do due diligence. We need to demonstrate that we have ideas about governing California as it is. And that means as one of the United States. So we're looking at ways that we can implement a sane and humane and effective immigration policies right now. Going back to our platform, even though California that lives under the federal government cannot adopt immigration policies that the CNP believes are fair and just, there's several actions that we can undertake right now. These include ensuring that all residents, including undocumented immigrants, have access to state services, beginning a system of residency permits, developing responsible guest worker programs, and continuing to uh, develop policies of noncompliance with federal immigration authorities and statutes when their actions threaten law-abiding, California law-abiding, members of our communities. Thanks for taking some time to look at a presentation about immigration and how it can work in California. If you have any questions, please get in touch with us. We'd be glad to be in touch with you. Until later, I'm Ken Brucker. Hello and welcome to the presentation, Scotland Campaigning for Self-Determination. This presentation was created by Scottish independence activists who are members of the Scottish National Party. These individuals are Angus Brown Lee, Ian White, and DJ Johnston Smith, who was the SNP candidate for the Scottish Parliament for the East Lothian constituency. They created this presentation to show us how the Scottish independence movement campaigns, and it will also give us a sense of the road ahead for us, though obviously uh, how things play out in California is going to be different than Scotland. First, uh, it's important to note that the way ahead is long and challenging. 
this won't be a quick campaign. Scotland's campaign for independence, perhaps one of the most well-known in the modern world, um, began in uh, 1707, which is not to say that all campaigns will last this long, but it's a good example in terms of, you know, independence doesn't happen overnight. It requires patience and personal sacrifice. The earliest years, which is where we are now, uh, are the hardest because, you know, the road is long and um, the challenges are formidable. So 313 years after the beginning of the Scottish independence movement, uh, we, you see a SNP minority government uh, in 2007 and then an SNP majority government in 2011 for the first time. Currently, the SNP controls the Scottish Parliament uh, in coalition with the Green Party, and there's a predicted similar coalition f for the next election. Uh, you can see these numbers in terms of MPs, MSPs, and uh, pre-Brexit MEPs. And as you can see now, towards the bottom of the slide, is the first time that there's been majority support for Scottish independence. So the Scottish National Party is the spearhead of the independence movement in Scotland. Um, currently, they're in a coalition government uh, that actually runs Scotland. And of course, they have a website, Facebook and Twitter, which we'll look at more later. Scottish National Party was established in 1934 as a result of the merger of a couple of other independence-minded parties. And it took them 11 years before they won a seat in the UK Parliament. By contrast, of course, the California National Party is only five years old. And I'm not going to talk through absolutely all these slides, so please read them. I'll touch some of the high points and I'll leave time for you to read the rest of them as I continue with this presentation. I do love this uh, slogan, Stop the World, Scotland Wants to Get On. So the SNP really started to take off electoral-wise in 1974, when it won seven seats and then 11 seats in two uh, elections in relatively close succession. I think the most interesting aspect of this is in 1997, uh, the Scottish Parliament was born out of a referendum. And it began to uh, reconvene in 1999. Under the leadership of Alex Salmond, the SNP became a serious party of government, leading to its first majority government in 2011.
Another important aspect of this slide is that up until 2015, the SMP was a kind of a broad church party, so not as ideologically focused as a lot of other parties. And that's kind of where the California National Party is now to some degree trying to reflect kind of the mainstream California sentiment. Though since then, uh, the SMP has moved in a more left-leaning direction, uh, which I think also reflects mainstream Scottish sentiment. But I think it's important to note that uh, parties can change their ideological stripes over time. And what the SNP seeks is an independent Scotland within the European Union, an independent currency, a better social security system, progressive, pragmatic, and simple taxation, getting rid of nuclear weapons, abolishing tuition and fees for colleges, protecting Scotland's National Health Service, which provides health care for all, Uh, zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045, better transportation, humane immigration policies, baby boxes for every newborn child in Scotland. So what a baby box is, it's a box that comes to a new, mo a new mother and has a whole bunch of items that are helpful in caring for her child. Um, getting rid of homelessness, and making Scotland a world leader in equality. And of course, if one looked at the California National Party's 2020 platform, there'd be a lot in common with these goals. So the ways that the SMP are divided up are presented here. Branches are the smallest division. They're the most local, and therefore, you know, since all politics is local, they are the most important. For us, branches would probably be called um, local chapters. So constituency associations are a grouping that encompass a constituency. So a member of the Scottish Parliament would represent a specific constituency, and that constituency would be a constituency association. And of course, the annual national conference would be something like what you're watching us do right now, which is the you're currently watching the California National Party's annual conference. Um, of course, we call it an annual convention, but it's a similar process. So the National Executive Committee is a decision-making body that is elected by the party. It would be similar to the California National Party's leadership committee. And much like in the California National Party, the National Council makes decisions in between the annual conferences. Though, of course, our processes are a little different. The National Assembly primarily relates to the SMP's party policies.
SMP headquarters is their headquarters, and that's their only paid staff, which is different from us because we don't have any paid staff at all. As the California National Party is a 100% volunteer party, looks like the SMP is similar, but they have a few paid staff at their headquarters. These are organizations affiliated with the SMP. So for example, YSI is Young Scots for Independence. That's for younger people, students, and so forth. And then other um, affiliated groups, such as representing the LGBTQIA plus community, uh, people who are disabled, etc. The SMP is a full member of the European Free Alliance. The European Free Alliance is a grouping of communities across Europe that seek independence. So like Scotland or like California, there are communities that would like to be an independent nation, but they exist under the control of some other nation, like the way that California is controlled by the United States or uh, Scotland in many ways is controlled from London, etc. So now we're going to look at how the SMP campaigns and maintains its momentum. So you start with information. You need to know which constituents voted for who in previous elections. You have to gather that information. And this information is also available to political parties in the United States. And uh, parties can gather it themselves as well by talking to people and asking them what their views are, etc., going door, door to door when there's not a global pandemic going on. We call it canvassing. And of course, it's different from how voter ID is talked about in the United States, where it involves um, making people show ID when they vote. Uh, voter ID in this context is about understanding your electorate. And once you have information about your electorate, you need to build a relationship with them. So you should always be trying to build a long-term meaningful relationship. And this can only be achieved through human interaction. So when you're engaged in this kind of work, just have conversations with your voters find out what their concerns are and pass that information on to the party so that we can use it to chart future policies. And of course, listening to people makes them feel heard, makes them feel more in favor of what the California National Party seeks, which is um, you know better government for California and in the long term, California independence. And in terms of the California National Party, we collect information and place it into a CIVI CRM database. And if you like working with databases, uh, please email me at theo.slater at californianational.party so that I can get you involved in our data collection and use processes.
So we would call these direct mailers. And usually in the U.S. they're used, in the U.S. and California, they're used in the context of campaigns. And what this is looking at is using direct mailers to just create an ongoing conversation and connection between voters and, and in, in the case here, the Scottish National Party, and in our case, the California National Party. I think a really good point that's made here is uh, sending a targeted letter to each new voter before they voted for the first time because getting someone to vote for the California National Party initially is going to be easier than getting them to convert from some other party to the, Calif Cal the California National Party. And leafleting would be going door to door and handing a prospective voter a, a leaflet and talking to them about uh, you know, what you're advocating for with the leaflet with a 10 second pitch. We'll want to do this once there's not a global pandemic right now. This isn't particularly safe, but it's important to keep in mind the strategies we will need once this current emergency passes. And here's an example of a leaflet. This is for DJ Johnston Smith. Here are some examples of what uh, leaflets look like. Actually, this is a specific leaflet that was used in 2016. And I will give you a minute to look over this. As you can see from the quote by Jess Wilson, in Scotland, they can vote at 16. And leaflets fall into two main categories, local leaflets for local campaign campaigns and national leaflets reflecting the priorities of the party as a whole. Examples of slogans for national campaigns are things like keep the Tories out. Uh, of course, the Tories are sort of like the Republicans in the UK. Or stronger for Scotland. So stalls, uh, this is a strategy we've actually used in the California National Party before. Uh, we've done them at farmers markets, but they could also be done at um, other local places, just any forum where a lot of people gather, flea markets, that type of thing. So you want to set them up with good foot traffic, move the locations around so you reach different people. They need to be clearly visible and look good. No more than three people at a time. Other people should be out handing out leaflets or getting voter information. And you don't have to wait for people to come to your stall. You can approach them. Try and get photos of people in front of the stall with their consent, of course, because then you can use that on social media. And you can use it as a base of operations for other canvassing stuff. So you can have supplies at a stall 
where there's water and snacks and so forth, and you can send out teams to that area to collect information from voters or do leafleting, etc. And this is what their stalls look like. Ours look somewhat similar. If you've seen some of the um, stalls we've done in the past, which we've posted to our own social media. So postal ballots um, are something that are very common in California. I actually vote by a postal ballot. And we want to encourage California National Party supporters to vote by mail because it ensures that they vote. And you know, if it happens to be raining, which of course doesn't happen all that often in California necessarily, but uh, if there's bad weather on the day of a ballot that can impact turnout, if our supporters vote by mail, then the weather is irrelevant, how busy their lives are, you know, won't necessarily get in their way if they can vote at their leisure at their home and simply mail in their ballot. So we should always encourage California National Party supporters to use mail-in ballots. This relates to get out the vote efforts for people who don't vote by mail. And this requires quite a bit of infrastructure, but it's essentially an effort to make sure by text, by phone, etc., that California National Party voters have actually gone to the polls and voted. And we could use text, alert, text alerts to remind people that it's polling day and perhaps even, you know, indicate where they're voting station is and things like that. And reading cards are a way of encouraging turnout. So a week before a ballot uh, vote, a week before voting day, uh, we'd send out these cards and then that would remind everyone to vote. I would say in California, because so many people vote by mail ahead of time, we might want to send them out earlier, but the concept would be the same. And this is really a key element to the success of any political party, and it will be a key element to the su success of the California National Party, and that's to actually get involved in our local communities. So, so far the California National Party has done this a few ways. I've mentioned that we've set up booths at farmer's markets. We've also done beach and river cleanups and other things that show our love of California and get us involved in our local communities. All right, now we're gonna look at social media. And this is what the California National Party has done most. A good reality check here, social media needs to be a campaign tool, not the whole toolbox. And this makes the excellent point that it's very hard to change people's minds on social media. It's mostly an echo chamber.
So here are some tips. So pages should be run by a team of multiple people from different backgrounds. Never use the first person. Always say we, our, the CNP. Of course, they would say the SNP. Plain text is boring, so use graphics, videos, photos. And we need to work on this uh, specific colors, designs, fonts, that so that people can recognize our messaging immediately. And of course, keep posts relevant to our and focused on our local and national issues. No more than three to four posts or tweets per day except for on very specific days, like um, when our platform comes out, uh, when there are you know, important speeches, polling day, televised debates, that kind of thing. When to post is very important. Um, before 9 a.m., before lunch, right at the end of work, and then in the early evening. So I usually post around 9.30, and that allows time for a post to get a little bit of traction so that it's showing up for a lot of people in a lot of people's feeds at 9 a.m. when they show up to work and maybe do a little social media activity before they actually start work. Similarly, lunch, um, you know, people take off, for, take off lunch and maybe look at social media while they are eating, a uh, similar idea for the end of work, and then when they get home. Posts should be positive whenever possible. Don't get involved in lengthy debates with individuals from the party account. If you want to debate with somebody, then log into your personal account, go to that page, and debate with them through your personal account rather than debating with them through the public account of the party. Post about up upcoming meetings and campaign activities, what local candidates and representatives are doing, and anything going on in the community, like if, you know, if there's a beach cleanup, a river cleanup, that type of thing, that's a perfect type of thing to post to social media before it happens, while it's happening, and after it happens. And if you're interested in getting involved in the California National Party's social media team, please email theo.slater at californianational.party. So highlight other independence movements and um, what are other countries that are kind of a similar size in GDP. So like, for example, Poland has a population that's similar to California's and like the United Kingdom's, like the United Kingdom, <coughs> excuse me, the United Kingdom has an economy of roughly uh, similar size to California, though California's economy is actually bigger than that of the United Kingdom. And I also think highlighting smaller parties can be, I mean, smaller countries can be useful. For example, you know, Scotland has a much smaller population than California, but it will be its own vibrant nation, just like Norway or Scandinavia are, even though they have much smaller populations than California also. Don't use anything that's copyrighted. Or really, I should say, don't use anything that's copyrighted without permission. So if you're going to plan and do a um, California National Party event in your city, we would want to send out posts that include photos of similar events and, <clears throat> excuse me, notify local supporters of the event to maximize turnout. 
and then get a picture of everyone who attends, uh, you know, everyone who comes to a stall uh, for using for social media after the event has taken place. Here's the street stall again. And also take photos to show proof of activism. So when you're collecting information on voters in your district or handing out leaflets get photos with voters of course with their consent so that we can use those for various purposes for social media and you can also take photos with street signs to show people where you are in their community to show people the grassroots efforts that are being undertaken. So this is an example of what to post prior to setting up a booth so that people know it's going know that it's going on and know about the event or are excited about it. And then these are also the kinds of photos that are useful after you know to take to show uh, local involvement, local activism, that type of thing. So now we'll talk about social media graphics. Graphics should be eye-catching, have the party logo, and use the party's colors. We, ours are uh, a blue and yellow, not so different from the SMPs, but not this quite the same shade. We would call it blue and gold. No, it's not really like a metallic gold. So graphics should include key policies, quotes from leaders, party achievements, party goals, and they can also involve election results. Here are some examples of some graphics. Here are some more graphics. So when commenting on similar movements, we want to keep a healthy distance so we don't appear to be interfering in their affairs. Certainly, it's good to encourage similarly placed movements, uh, such as Ascara, Ascara Republicana in Catalonia or uh, the SMP, etc. Uh, you know, if you're going to talk about injustice or oppression, be sure to point out that it's being brought out by the national government, not the nation itself. So, uh, you know, if uh, the Spain sends a whole bunch of uh, baton wielding national police into Catalonia to smash people's heads open, talk about it as something being done by the Spanish government, not something being done by Spain. And if you're wishing luck to a, another party, try and use their hashtags and repost their social media materials. 
and uh, again, never attack the state itself or the nation, attack its national government. So here are some examples on commenting on other movements. So these are some mock-ups that our friends made to kind of show how a tweet, tweets would look in line with these guidelines. So videos, uh, there we should involve uh, once available once we have candidates and elected officials we should do regular film uh, short films involving these candidates to highlight specific goals and important issues and talk about like local go goals and so forth what we can do now is do more video messaging from the California National Party's Leadership Committee, which is something that I'm going to try to do over the course of the next year. So here are some examples of some videos and I'm going to show a few of these videos. So we're in I'm out today, out campaigning. If we don't come to your doorstep, we miss you, get in touch. I'm happy to talk to anyone or answer any questions you might have. Do you know, the Berkshire coastline is always worth a visit. It's stunning. And even on a day like this, you can enjoy the waves and go and give it a, get a fantastic fish and chips or some brilliant ice cream. Now, we'll be putting across the, the positive case for why you should vote SNP and why you should vote for me in this election. But a lot of people on the doorstep are saying to us they're really quite scared of the prospect of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister and the hard Brexit that our former Tory MP has already shown he's perfectly willing to support. And that fear has been heightened after that debate last night and the appalling behaviour of the Tories who put up a fake Twitter account, who put up a fake website for the Labour manifesto. That's not the politics we want. We don't want a Tory MP that'll just fall in behind that. Boris Johnson has already boasted all his MPs will do exactly as they're told. That's not what the borders want. If you, like me, want the borders to get its voice back, if you want us to escape Brexit and you believe Scotland has the right to choose its own future, vote SNP. All right, so that was a video by Callum Carr. And you know, it involved, uh, looked at local concerns, referenced where it was geographically and talked about issues involving uh, and in the concern of the people who he was seeking the vote from. So now we'll look at one of the Twitter posts, uh, another video. In constituencies across Scotland, every single vote will count towards stopping Brexit and Boris Johnson. The best way to stop the Tories in Scotland isn't by voting for the party closest to them in the polls UK-wide, but by backing Scotland's strongest Remain party, the SNP. In every single seat held by the Tories in Scotland, it is the SNP that is the main challenger and best placed to win this election. Voting for anyone other than the SNP risks splitting the progressive vote and letting the Tories in through the back door. The more SNP MPs we elect, the stronger Scotland's voice to remain in the European Union will be. 
Every vote for the Scottish Tories will help Boris Johnson to deliver Brexit. Put Scotland's future in Scotland's hands, not Boris Johnson's. Vote SNP on Thursday, December the 12th and let's escape Brexit. And so this is a more national message. I like how they use the um, argument that's often used in the U.S. and in California about, you know, if you vote, don't vote Democrat, you're helping the Republicans. The um, SNP really used that to their advantage to say that if you vote Scottish Labor, it helps the Tories because you're splitting the vote for their progressive parties. So you should only vote for the SNP. Kind of an interesting way to frame that. And I think that was an interesting video. And this is a GIF. It's a much shorter message, uh, just six seconds long. All right, so these are examples of social media videos, and uh, we'll continue the presentation. We've already watched this video. All right, so now we're going to look at overall campaign advice, activist training. So of course, everyone in the California National Party is an unpaid volunteer. So how do we get unpaid volunteers to represent the party as well as possible? The way we do that is training. So teaching people how to interact with the public, teaching people how to speak professionally, relate to the public professionally, be respectful, And also we need to have our volunteers attain a certain level of self-confidence just to be able to positively assert our message in a way that's persuasive and compelling. So language is supremely important. Anytime something is put out whenever possible, you know, a second person should look it over and make sure it doesn't have any spelling mistakes, any grammar mistakes. Think about how a message could be misinterpreted in a way that could be negative to any particular community. Make sure that any message is clear and easy to understand. So like avoid political jargon. Keep messaging positive and inclusive. So we need to be constantly evolving. We need to be changing our messaging to meet the time and, and, and communities that we seek to engage. And we need to show a narrative of progress. Never take supporters for granted. And I would say this is one of the best opportunities for the California National Party is that the two-party system in the United States and in California really lead to both of those parties really taking their people for granted because you know they, they, they feel like they have nowhere else to go. And what we can provide to our supporters is somewhere else to go. A party that really will represent its supporters' interests, that will really champion better government for every Californian. And then we should encourage all of our supporters to, to participate at whatever level is of interest to them. So if they just want to be, vote for us, great. If they just want to volunteer for us on a limited basis, great. If they want to volunteer for us more expansively, fantastic. But it's about, you know, for any particular California National Party supporter, what's their level of support? How involved do they want to be?
And I think this is a really great point, so I will read it. If you if you really want to change a political paradigm, only hard work from you can make that happen. House by house, street by street, community by community, you can make the change you want. And once you've completed the cycle, you have to start again. So every election cycle. No figure, no celebrity, no newspaper, no meme, no retweet, no single act of political activism is going to achieve the aim that you want. Only the actions of you and thousands like you will do that. And that's from DJ Johnston Smith. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for attending the California National Party's 2020 convention, or if you're watching this as part of some other event, thank you for that. And uh, I look forward to meeting all of you. If you want a copy of this PowerPoint, you can email me at theo.slater at californianational.party. And you can also use that to uh, get in touch with me about any issue or wanting to get more involved in the California National Party. So once again, that is theo.slater at californianational.party. And thank you for watching this presentation. Okay, so with that, we have reached the conclusion of the California National Party's 2020 virtual convention. Uh, so please don't forget to vote uh, for the leadership committee and on the 2020 platform, uh, as well as please filling out uh, our membership survey. And of course, be sure to contact us if you wanna learn more or get more involved with the party. Whatever skill set you have, the California National Party could gratefully use it. More than anything else, however, what we need now are registered members so that we can reach qualified status. As the Scottish National Party presentation highlighted, party building is a long, difficult process. And here in California, it can be even more complex. I will not bore people with the details of how difficult the California Secretary of State makes it to form a new political party. But I would simply like to point out that in the last 30 years in California, only three new political parties have gained qualified status. The Green Party, the Reform Party, and the Natural Law Party. The last of these two no longer exist, and all three of them were backed by interests outside California. So the California National Party is really a first in the sense that it is a completely California-based movement. And because of that, it is going to take time to build up our party and reach our goals. But to do that, we need people who will register as members of the California, California National Party. And so especially considering that the top two primary system we have here in California now confers absolutely no benefit to registering as a Democrat or registering as a no party preference. It makes sense that everyone who is interested in supporting California independence, or at the very least, a more California-centric based politics can register with our party and still maintain the ability to vote in all California and federal elections. So we cannot allow impatience to make us lose sight of our goals. We have to remember that the California National Party, like California itself, is a project. And just as every Californian is important and useful, every Californian can contribute to the California National Party. So if you'd like to help, please reach out to us. Until then, I'm Chair Michael Loeb, and on behalf of the California National Party, I'd like to thank you for watching. I would like to thank all of our presenters for their time. And if you will allow me to steal a phrase, next year in the real world. Thank you, and I hope to see you then.